today's webinar, we're going to be talking about infant feeding, specifically focusing on those months between six to nine months. Um, so we're really going to focus on talking about tr texture transition, teething, and learning your baby signals and the challenges that may come along with those things. My name is Jacqueline Adler. I'm a dietitian with the Hamilton Family Health Team, and I'm joined today by Megan uh, Sullivan. She's also a dietitian with our with the Hamilton Family Health Team, and so we're going to take you through infant feeding today. Um, and we're glad to have you back after last week's session. And so we'll just go right ahead. So the topics for today, for six to nine months, we're going to focus on talking about key nutrients for optimal growth because babies grow at such a rapid pace during these months. We want to make sure that they're getting everything that they need to have that peak growth. How and when to transition to different textures. We're going to really dive into some parenting versus infant roles in feeding uh, and then some go, move on into self-feeding and why it's important. One thing we find comes up a lot is that parents sometimes might think that funny faces mean one thing when it really means something else. So we think this is important to discuss. We'll then dive into some nutrition challenges that we find come up a lot in clinic at this age. So constipation, allergies, and also if you're choosing to raise a vegetarian or vegan baby. And then always we'll uh, support and encourage the benefit of connecting with an RD for individual support. If your doctor is a physician with the Fa Hamilton Family Health Team, you, are, you do have access to a registered dietitian through their clinic. So in, in office and clinic working as a dietitian, some of the common infant feeding issues that we come in contact with are starting solids. So even getting that going with babes, um, some, some might start too late or might start too early. So we're going to go over um, maybe some of the concerns around starting too late or starting too early. Bottle feeding is a big one. You know, propped bottles, formula switching or inappropriate formulas are also some challenges that we see. When babe is having too much milk or juice and the effects of those having too much of those. Another thing we want to talk about is self-feeding and the importance of self-feeding and the challenges around it and definitely addressing the messiness that it comes with that. Then we'll get into some food safety concerns around eating and then uh, we'll talk about allergens. All right, so this is a little bit of review if you joined us last week, but we're going to go over it again. The importance of iron-rich foods from four to six months. Babe has an increased need for iron at this time. Babies are born with um, their iron stores from their mom that they got in utero. And we find that these stores run out somewhere between four to six months, depending on how good mom's stores were during pregnancy. So if mom had great iron stores, we usually find babe gets to six months. If maybe mom had some iron issues in pregnancy, we may notice that babe's iron stores run out a little sooner, so around four months of age. Because breast milk doesn't provide any iron, it's at these ages when babe's stores have depleted that we need to introduce uh, food sources of iron just to meet the needs for that rapid growth and development that they do after this age. So some people might ask, yeah, but my formula has iron in it. Formula does have a good source of iron, but it's still very important to have complementary foods just for variety and also long-term health. So we want to transition babe onto these foods so that for long-term health, they're well exposed and well adjusted to eating iron-rich foods. So let's talk about what about we start solids too soon. Sometimes we have moms or dads coming in and they've started a baby, you know, before that four to six month range. And what, what are the problems with that? So basically the infant is not physiological ready for food before that age. If they can't turn their head to the side to tell you when they're full, that can be of concern. Uh, the extrusion reflex is still present before four to six months. That reflex is the tongue pushing out all of the time going like this, that is still present at that age, and that's another sign that they're not ready to accept and swallow the food properly. If your baby isn't opening its mouth when food is offered, so if you bring food to the mouth and they're not opening and accepting and using that extrusion reflex, that's another sign that they're not ready for solid foods. If they can't hold their head up or sit independently, that can be dangerous for introducing solid foods, and we don't want to do it before they have those skills. 
One other thing to look out for is if they reach out or are curious about food. We usually find before the ages of four to six months, this isn't a very common interest in solid foods. And if they're not look, having that sign, it's also still too soon, too early. And the biggest risk is choking if you start solids too soon, which I know no parent wants to deal with. Okay, and what about the flip side? On the other side, why is it important to not start too late? So the most important thing would be that iron deficiency anemia. Babies usually require less than a milligram of iron per day. And then when they get to six months up until 12 months, they need 11 per day. So there's a great increased need of iron during this time because they're growing and developing so rapidly. And that's the most important reason we won't, don't want to start too late. And also the most important reason why we start with iron rich foods. So some signs to look for in your babe or anyone with iron deficiency anemia would be pale conjunctivia. Conjunctivia means um, is this the um, inside around the eye, it should be pink in color when someone has good iron stores. If that looks very pale, that could be a sign of iron deficiency. You may want to talk to your doctor if you're noticing that. We'll also see a drop in growth rate. So because they need so much iron to grow properly and, and follow their growth curve, if they don't have enough iron, we'll see kind of a flattening on their growth curve or maybe even a drop in worst cases. And that's something we'd want to correct. And there can also be long-term effects on brain development if iron deficiency anemia happens in these crucial developmental stages. So very important not to start too late. So those are the physical signs. Behavioral signs that your baby um, may need more iron or have started taking iron too late could be they're not playing, they're clinging to you a lot, very irritable. I know all babies can kind of have those signs, but if those are accompanied with some of the physical signs above, you may want to come see your doctor or nurse or dietitian to talk about iron. And remember, like I said before, iron stores from the mom is depleted between four to six months. Sooner if mom delivered early or had a pre-existing anemia in pregnancy. So if mom's pregnancy, she was low in iron herself and she wasn't able to pass on to babe the amount of iron to get them to six months. Uh, therefore, they, that might happen a little sooner than four to six. And breast milk has no iron, so iron-rich foods are critical. So let's talk about some supplements and other vitamins. So do I need to give my baby a vitamin D supplement? You need to supplement with 400 international units, or IU, of vitamin D3. There's another form of vitamin D, D2. The form that we need is D3. And breastfed babies need this every day because there's not enough vitamin D in breast milk to support the needs that they, ha that they have. Um, you also may want to supplement if you're using a formula, depending on how much formula your baby is consuming. So if you read the label on your formula and how much vitamin D is in an ounce or a serving and work out how much babe takes in a day, if it doesn't add up to 400 international units, you may want to top them up with some extra vitamin D supplement. There's very limited sources of vitamin D outside of supplementation, very limited in our fish, and milk is fortified with some vitamin D. We get some vitamin D from the sun in the summer. However, because we all wear sunblock or sunscreen to uh, prevent having skin damage and other issues, vitamin D production is reduced or blocked in the skin. Raising a vegetarian baby. So if anyone is interested in raising the their baby to be vegetarian, we want to make sure that we're meeting the nutrient needs for optimal growth. One, some of the most important nutrients you want to focus on would be iron, of course, like we've talked about. Vitamin B12 can be difficult to get complete needs in a vegetarian diet, so you may need to supplement with that, as well as vitamin D. Okay, so... A lot of questions around texture we get very often in practice. So one of the questions we get is, can my baby eat foods even though with texture, even though they don't have any teeth? And our answer would be yes. Um, it is very important that babies are very good at just gumming foods. And it's very important that we do transition textures around that eight, nine month mark um, to make sure the baby is developing the skills and the physical ability to tolerate different textures. So you wanna start off 
pretty um, uh, liquidy right at the six month mark if, if that's when you're starting solids and then slowly transition by maybe adding less liquid into the purees, maybe pulsing it a little bit um, a fewer times and then eventually just sort of using a fork to mash it up so that it's very lumpy and you offering that progression of texture. If you're deciding to go with more finger foods, um, you still very much need to cook and make sure that the texture is soft enough for baby to tolerate and not choke, but um, you can certainly do it in more of a finger food method similar to baby led weaning. So that would bring us into the texture transition. So you're thinking about starting at six months, then you would likely start with purees um, around that between six and nine months, every baby's a little bit different. As, mentioned, as Megan mentioned, that extrusion reflex does recede around the six month mark, but some babies take a little bit longer. So you just wanna go according to the baby and what they're telling you. If they're sort of um, going through the purees and the mash and the small chunks very seamlessly, you, then you can go um, along their needs. And if they're taking a little bit longer, no problem. We, we like to check in around that nine months mark to make sure that texture is being progressed and the baby is um, accepting it okay. Um, and so this is a really other great time to meet with your dietitian to see that baby is able to tolerate different textures. Beyond nine months, around the nine to 12 month mark, we wanna make sure that baby is able to tolerate soft, chopped, and cubed foods. Um, this is also a really good time to encourage the switch from the bottle to the cup so that baby's learning to take liquid from an open cup. It will be messy, but that is okay. It's part of the learning process. Um, the alternative to this would be the baby led weaning approach that we talked about last week. Again, if you skip the purees and you go with baby led weaning, you still certainly do need to make sure that the food is soft enough. Basically the rule of thumb is that you should be able to press it in between your forefinger and your thumb and get all the way through. That would be a good indication that it's soft enough, but you would just leave it in its original form. So getting messy, we get this one a lot, questions about my kid just throws the food all around or my kid throws it on themselves, they hardly get anything in their mouth. Getting messy is just part of the process. They certainly enjoy it, it's fun, and you certainly want to encourage it. Maybe not encourage the bowl on their head, but allow baby to play. It's really part of the learning process, touching the food, experiencing it, and getting to know that all foods are good and accepted is part of them learning that um, this is really important. So encourage it. I know it gets a little messy, but it's part of it. Um, how often does my baby need to eat during the day? This is another really common question we get in family practice. Babies have really tiny tummies, so they might fill up really quickly, um, even the size of their fist. So they might fill up really quickly, but they're growing so rapidly that they need food more often than you might expect. So we encourage you to offer meals and snacks about two hours apart, according to your baby's hunger cues. This is something to think about in that six to nine months mark. You might think about developing a schedule that works for you so that you're including um, solids in addition to formula or breast milk and sort of working it in into that um, offering something every two hours. So we're not really in that six to 12 month mark, we're not really taking the place of formula or breast milk yet. We're just sort of accommodating it and moving it in. Beyond 12 months, some of the solid foods is going to take the place of the formula and breast milk, but at this stage, we're working it in. This is just a sample menu of what your day might look like between six and 12 months of feeding your baby. So you can see that at the six month mark, breast milk or formula you could substitute there would be still priority. There's lots of opportunity for breast milk and formula feeding and you're probably just gonna offer solids a couple of times a day, um, mostly purees. But you can also see there that every time that it's being offered, just twice a day is still um, iron rich sources of food. So we prioritize that first. Beyond, between six and nine months, you're going to start offering foods a bit more often, maybe three, four times a day. Again, prioritizing iron rich foods, as well as maybe offering some more variety, like small pieces of toast, mashed vegetables, some mashed fruit, um, and, and any other sort of food that you want in addition to those iron rich foods. Um, and then at nine to 12 months, you can see they're eating quite often three meals a day, three snacks, prioritizing iron-rich foods, and then breast milk 
or formula in addition to that. So questions about babies' responsibilities around eating come up a lot. We really encourage something called the division of responsibility. Um, this is the theory that um, it's baby's responsibility to decide um, when, if they will eat and how much they will eat. But it's your responsibility to decide what kind of food your baby is going to be offered, when it's offered, so your schedule, and where to feed the baby. So we encourage, of course, at a high chair or somewhere safe, the baby not walking around or can risk choking. But we really want to trust the baby in, and they do know how hungry and full they are. So if some days they eat a lot, great. And if other days they eat very little, that's also okay. We want to um, encourage that and foster that good intuitive um, relationship with their body and food so that they um, can trust you in turn to offer those foods when they need them. So this is where the funny face comes up. If my baby is making a funny face, does that mean they don't like the food? We've all seen those videos of the funny faces that babies make maybe when they eat something, not just a lemon, but um, certainly it doesn't mean that the baby doesn't like the food. They're just making a different expression, maybe surprise or squinting. Certainly it's just something new in their mouth and they're experiencing it for the first time and that's just kind of how it comes across. Um, but we wouldn't say that any uh, facial expression would mean that you can't offer it again. In fact, even if food, regardless of the facial expression, even if a food is not accepted um, the first time, it doesn't mean that it won't be accepted the second, third, fourth, fifth, maybe 10th time. So we certainly encourage to continue offering previously refused foods. So there's, they're definitely normal to make funny faces while eating. Um, tastes and textures, it sometimes gets a little, takes a little bit of time to get used to. Like I said, sometimes it can take up to 10 uh, times to offer a food, even if they don't touch it the first few times, before it makes it into their mouth voluntarily. So keep offering those foods that they may not have liked the first time. This is also another strategy to prevent picky eating down the road. The, um, Offering foods uh, frequently, offering variety, demonstrating that you're eating them, certainly helps them to build um, acceptance towards different foods and continue to have a good relationship down the road with food. Okay, so in addition to food, another thing that we want to start thinking about and talking about at this age is when is your child ready to drink from a cup? It may be ready sooner than you realize. We actually encourage that when you start solid foods at around six months of age, that we also uh, encourage you to start uh, working with baby to learn how to drink from an open cup. We don't recommend sippy cups because sippy cups use different muscles in the mouth than open cups or swallowing and the way that we eat as you know, older children and adults, we want to foster the muscles that help children to have the best chewing and swallowing experiences. And it's been shown that sippy cups actually go against this, as well as sippy cups have been linked with more tooth decay. So that's what we really encourage and recommend an open cup. You'll see in the picture there, the mom or dad who's helping the babe drink from the open cup, babe's opening the mouth, accepting the cup. And you also may find that your baby will take in more uh, ounces of water or fluid, which can sometimes be lower when they're younger drinking from sippy cup when it's an open cup because they open the mouth and accept a nice big gulp. So please at six months start working with them with an open, open cup. If you do have uh, times when you'd like to have a some sort of to-go cup with them because you're running out or something in your diaper bag, we would more so recommend a straw type cup rather than the sippy cup. So then next at nine months of age, oh, at nine months of age, you can start weaning your baby from the bottle. Again, I find some moms and dads find that this is sooner than they realize, but we do encourage at this age because there's so much development going on with everything, including the mouth and chewing and swallowing. We find the earlier, the better for getting babe off a bottle, also for the development of muscles and teeth in the mouth. So at nine months of age, you can start weaning. The process that we usually recommend for weaning is you may first move to your baby's bottle of least choice. So if they always have this favorite bottle that they love to suck on, some of that might be related to soothing and not necessarily related to wanting 
um, that milk or formula at that time either. So choose a bottle maybe that's of their least preference. The next thing you can do is before they have a bottle feeding, you can actually put the formula or breast milk, or at nine months it might even be homogenized milk, into an open cup first. Assist babe with drinking some from the open cup. If they don't finish it all, then you could pour the rest into the bottle and feed the rest that way. So that's another option. Um, you could also choose one feeding at a time. So let's say babe at the moment at nine months has four bottles a day. Choose one bottle in the day, perhaps one that you know, they may be in a good mood and more open to doing something a little different and switch the whole feeding to an open cup. Once that's well established and going well, move on to the other feedings as the time goes on. And at one year of age, we would hope that you've worked away from uh, nine months to one year of being bottle free. So something really, really important that I'm sure moms and dads are very concerned about is keeping your child safe when they're eating. This can be one of the scary things when we start introducing solids. You know, hearing that first gagging sound from your baby can be quite frightening. One thing that we do want to say that's reassuring is that gagging is not choking. Gagging has sound. It's actually baby learning how to move the food around in their, uh, their mouth. It's not choking. Actually learning how not to choke. So although gagging may sound very scary, it's, it's definitely not choking. Choking has no sound. And that's why we do encourage parents to have certification CPR for infants and children so that you're well equipped if that does happen at home. Now ways we can prevent that from happening at home is you can avoid hard or round foods such as popcorn, whole carrots or grapes, hot dogs, which can be quite choking hazards. So anything that's round and hard, we tend to avoid when they're young. Like Jacqueline said earlier, ensure foods are soft and well cooked until your baby is able to safely progress to harder foods. I like that thing she used about you squeeze it between your fingers and if you can get your fingers through, then it's probably soft enough. And let baby tell you when they're ready for some more advanced textures. Please don't ever leave baby alone while eating. You wanna be supervising this. And never serve foods when your baby is crawling, cruising or toddling. Their mobility is very, um, is not well established at these young ages and definitely a choking hazard if they eat while they're on the go. The one food you do wanna avoid giving your baby before the age of 12 months is honey, whether that's pasteurized or unpasteurized. Uh, baby's immune system, especially in their gut, they don't have the right probiotics to deal with honey because honey can have some bacterial spores in it that can cause a lot of problems, health problems for babe. After a year of age, they're able to have honey because their immune system and their microbiota in their gut has developed enough to be able to deal with those bacterial spores that may be in honey without any issues. Please just avoid it until 12 months. So when can I introduce cow's milk to my baby? So like I said, mentioned earlier, around nine months, you might be putting homogenized milk in that open cup because that's the age that we recommend you can if you're interested in introducing cow's milk. You want your baby to be really well established on eating a variety of solid foods, especially iron rich foods, before we introduce cow's milk. Cow's milk can interfere with the absorption of iron. So we wanna make sure babe is taken in lots of iron with no problem before we introduce cow's milk. You can also use goat's milk as another suitable option, but you wanna make sure that it's pasteurized and also fortified with vitamin D and folic acid because these nutrients are not, um, are not high enough in goat's milk. And then you wanna offer the goat's milk or the homogenized milk from an open cup, like we said previously. Okay, so we said that you wanna avoid honey before 12 months of age, but what about all those other allergens we get asked about a lot? So we actually say there is no need to delay the introduction of a high allergen food, such as eggs, fish, or peanut butter, um, to babe. So in fact, there's a lot of research to show and the Canadian Pediatric Society supports introducing these foods at six months, even in infants who have a high risk of allergy. So a high risk of allergy might be an infant that's had eczema throughout its life or has a parent or a sibling with a food allergy. That's what a high risk for allergy means. Even in these high risks, or a baby that's not high risk, you do want to introduce these high allergen foods in small amounts. So for example, take a little peanut butter, rub it on the inside of their mouth, and look for reactions. 
Reactions could range from, you know, mild to severe. Some milder reactions, maybe some rash around the mouth after eating the food, some welts or hives that could also progress into some more serious reactions like vomiting or diarrhea, where you might want to call your family doctor and come in and see them about that. If you notice any shortness of breath or wheezing after baby introduces and ingests high allergen food, please call 911. Then if you have no reactions, we want you to wait two days and then you can offer another new high allergen food once you know you're in the clear. There's also some evidence to show that if your baby takes in, say, peanut butter or eggs, a high allergen food and tolerates it well, keep introducing that food to keep improving their tolerance to it. This is another common one. If baby is constipated, what should I do? So it can be common when you introduce solid foods, a baby can become a little constipated or not even, just that their stool habits, their bowel habits changes. So maybe baby used to go to the bathroom every day and now it's every three days. That can be completely normal. You may also notice changes in the stool. It might have a different color, a different smell, a different texture, all normal when you introduce solid foods. On some rare occasions, we do get babies who do get constipation when they get started on solid foods or even beforehand. Constipation will look like hard, round pellet stools. So it won't be soft, there won't be large, it'll be round, small, and pellet-like. That's what constipation is. So if you're seeing that, you may want to get in touch with your family physician or your dietitian. If you see any blood or mucus in the stool, you definitely want to contact your family doctor and come in for an appointment. If it is some constipation, some tips that we would give you is to increase your baby's fluid intake, so breastfeed more frequently, or if they are on an open cup, you can offer some more water to help make it easier to pass the stool. If that's not working, you can offer two ounces maximum of undiluted 100% fruit juice, such as pear juice or prune juice. You can add that throughout the day to see if that helps baby pass their stool easier. And then also along with the increase in fluid, we do recommend offering higher fiber fruits, so such as mashed up pears, blueberries, or you can also use uh, some legumes, so some bent beans or lentils have lots of fiber in them, or multigrain Cheerios or shreddies. So combining an increase in fluid with higher fiber foods, we tend to find is the best way to go about fixing baby's constipation. Okay, so that was a quick summary on how to introduce foods um, from six to nine months. So we wanna think about, wanna encourage you to take one small step today, maybe setting a goal if you haven't introduced um, allergenic foods and your baby's around six months, maybe that's your goal. But one thing that you can do um, each week, maybe it's getting in touch with your dietitian or your family doctor, if you have any concerns or, or if, even if you're you know, a bit hesitant, we can walk you through it and, and answer any individual questions. So what's one thing that you can do um, when it comes to baby um, introducing foods to your baby this week? Um, certainly, we always want to identify nutrition issues early. So as I mentioned, this earlier intervention and increasing variety of baby's foods, it has been linked to less picky eating later down the road or better relationship with food. So, you know, maybe... Um, if your baby is beyond beyond six months, you want to introduce, you want to book a, a visit with your dietitian. Um, maybe at your next well baby visit, that's a nice time to connect with your dietitian, ask your family doctor if um, that's a good idea for you. Maybe joining our next online webinar next week, we're going to have another session on nine months and beyond around um, introducing foods or continuing to introduce foods. And then connecting with other moms and dads that you know, um, asking um, what their tips and tricks are and bringing those questions to your dietitian or your family doctor if that's applicable to you. If you have any other nutrition questions, you can always email the dietitians at the Hamilton Family Health Team. You can visit our website at hamiltonfit.ca. There's an opportunity to send an email and one of our dietitians will answer you directly. Um, you can book an appointment, as we've mentioned several times, with your family doctor, your dietitian, or maybe your practice nurse. And then again, we are um, going to continue this series next week, same time, uh, Wednesday, July 22nd at 1 to 2 p.m. Um, in our third installment in this infant feeding series. As well, um, you can always find lots of good information at dietitians.ca or unlockfood.ca or as well beststart.org. 
I really want to thank you all for joining us today. We do have a poll that I'm going to start now. The questions there are simply to help us um, improve our delivery of online services. So we really appreciate um, you participating. We do have the questions up now. Um, if there are any questions from participants today, you can certainly enter them into the chat or the Q&A box that you have available um, on the bottom part portion of your Zoom screen. Um, and so we'll just see um, what those are. Megan, do you see any questions? I think I see a question. Um, one of the things that we commonly hear pretty often in practice, I don't know about you, but I always hear, I always have parents suspecting that iron deficiency in the back of their mind of, you know, what's one of the first signs before they're getting pale or before they're irritable? I would say one of the first signs could be a change in appetite. Would you have anything else to add to that? Change in appetite, or you, if you're attending your doctor's appointments regularly and there has been a decline in the weight from, because if you're there at one month, two, four, and six, you're there pretty often. If you see any decline on the growth curve at all, I would also suspect iron deficiency. And you can bring this up to your doctor or nurse if they don't bring it up to you already. Absolutely, yeah. It's an easy fix, and it's something that we want to prevent because it certainly is linked to long term. Um, consequences when it comes to brain development, as you mentioned. So we want to get it early and we want to just fix it easily with a supplement. And then um, we can, we often see that growth catch up pretty rapidly and, the, and their appetite comes right back. Um, any questions that you see? I am not seeing any in there right now. One of the other things um, that I hear about a lot is around um, questions around dairy versus milk. So one of the, one of the um, misconceptions when we say delay cow's milk to that nine to 12 month mark, it doesn't mean that we're saying delay all dairy. So that's just one of the um, things that I like to clarify. Um, the fact that Megan said, you know, dairy is safe, but cow's milk can interfere with absorption of iron. It's simply the fact that babies are drinking, willing to drink a lot. And so we would just want to um, limit how much they're drinking from the cow's milk source and get most of their fluid from breast milk and then um, make sure that they're getting enough iron before we introduce something else that can compete with that iron absorption. So it's completely fine to do some like shredded cheese or a little bit of yogurt in their day for a snack if you want before nine months, it's fine. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So those are um, most of the questions that I hear pretty often. Um, I don't see any other questions in our polling or on our Q&A, um, but I want to thank you all for joining us today. And again, we'll see you next week.